and singing. Okay, would um, someone be kind enough to offer the morning prayer? I can do that. Thank you, Melissa. Of course. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here this morning and grateful to learn from one another and pray that that would inspire, um, inspire us so to, to increase our knowledge, to increase opportunities to draw closer to Thee. We are so grateful for Eva and being here every morning and leading us through these discussions and so grateful for those who are participating and those who cannot and pray that they they are well and in good cheer we are just so humbled for all the opportunities we have to learn of thee we say this most humbly in jesus name amen amen thank you melissa thank you. that was beautiful thank you I'm grateful you all turn up so I don't have a solitary discussion by myself because <laughs> it's it's all of us that makes it work, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hopefully Matthew's computer will work today. There he is. Where is he in? Um, I was in Glade Park last week and it's super magical out there. Mm hmm. And did a big hike, and I was wondering if I was anywhere near him. Well, Matt, can you hear us? Yes. Well, good morning. <laughs> good morning. I was in your backyard. You. <laughs> Sweet. I Where think you? we should have a retreat out there. That would be so cool. <laughs> One of my neighbors sets up, he has a thing they call picking in the pinion. And he's just down the hill from me at the bottom of the valley. It's a uh, cowboy poetry and singing oh, little nice. festival they do. We get to hear it real good because all the speakers come right up the valley. But we're out there. Um, did you go as far as the post office? The Glade Park. I went to I went to the store. Took a right and went to um, Shea Sh Sh Canyon or something like that. Okay, so if you would, kept going e straight. Another 20 miles, that's out where I'm at. Oh, wow. Okay. I might have, we started your way, and then the Google took us another way. <laughs> yeah, all the hiking canyons and stuff over that way are out to the north or along the east. Beautiful. You know, if that was in Moab, it'd be like Disneyland. <laughs> We're only 40 miles from Moab, so we're pretty much the mountains on the top of Moab. Oh, wow. Well, it was beautiful out there. I'm well, very envious so. since I live in the city <laughs> <laughs> of Montrose. I it's really like nice to get out and get, get away. Yeah, we were out there all day. We found a cave. We found arches. It wow. was really cool. That's awesome. I second Melissa's um, hope to have a retreat or come hang out at uh, yours and Liz's property, Matt, this summer. Absolutely. It'll be we fun. can bring food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Eva's been eating and bear. We'll have to have her cook some of that up and try it. <laughs> yeah, I'll save some. Actually, um, my friend has still half of the bear, so there's plenty of bear. It's really good. <laughs> hmm. And she's, um, because she's uh, more or less, uh, she works in uh, shamanism. She's like, Eva, you must need this bear medicine for some reason. <laughs> the bear energy. So I'm like, great, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's delicious. Well. Alma chapter 14, uh, verse 2. Um, I was just saying how these uh, chapters um, going on, there's something big in it, I feel, um, that is opening up, at least to my heart and mind. It's building um, 
So when I, let me get my little piece of paper. It's, you know how the scriptures are not like lineal, linear. There's um, bits and pieces that stand out, chop and stand out and lessons in. Um, it doesn't read like a linear text, if that's the right word. Um, so considering uh, King Lamoni and his queen to me is like, not necessarily their, their story, but King Lamoni and the queen to me is like a Christ type and his consort and how the queen is the one that raises him from the dead, so to speak. And then going forward in the story, there's a type of um, King Lamoni bringing one to the father. So the Christ bringing to the Supreme King, the father. And, um, and how in that connection with the father, which in this case is uh, King Lamoni's father, um, there's given a new name to a group of people. And in that new name, it ties them to the covenant that is on this land, the Nephi-Lehi covenant. And the father also gives a decree. Um, and that decree um, is one of protection and provision. And then going further, which we haven't reached yet, but going further, there's a type of the people gather um, at the foot of a mountain while um, those who are fathering them, Ammon and others, ascend up the mountain to go and ask the fathers on the mountain for a safe place for their people. And um, there's some prophetic things in there too. And the fathers atop the mountain uh, dedicate a city to them uh, to go and live and have safety and protection. And those fathers more or less say that they will be the sentinels that will protect the people. And um, my goodness, there's like so much in there, which I'm really excited to um, read those types that I feel are um, applicable to potentially today. And when I was reading this last night, it really hit my heart about how sometimes we read these stories or I've certainly I've applied to myself. I've read these stories and thought that, you know, they were a lesser intelligent people and look at all these wars and, and primitive style of living. And but really like King Lamoni's people who then join with the father's people who are converted and then ascend up the mountain, I feel are better than myself like the sacrifices they're willing to make, they're willing to suffer and endure to keep the covenant, to suffer even death, to not lift a sword up against their brethren, um, to not stain their swords with blood any longer. And how while we might not be murdering each other, we certainly can murder each other's hearts um, with our words and our actions and behavior and how the because of their conversion, uh, it was so awful to them to think of wounding even those who came to wound them. Um, I'm like, wow, these people are better than me. <laughs> um, anyhow, there are some thoughts to keep in, in mind and you probably have other thoughts, um, but I really feel going forward, it's becoming really prophetic. Um, okay, so uh, verse two, if someone would like to uh, start reading from there. Thank you. Read. Thank you. Uh -huh. And now it came to pass that when the king had sent forth this proclamation, that Aaron and his brethren went forth from city to city and from one house of worship to another, establishing churches and consecrating priests and teachers throughout the land among the Lamanites, 
to preach and to teach the word of God among them, and thus they began to have great success. And thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord, yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites, and they were taught the records and the prophecies handed down even to the present time. And as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as believed, or as many as were brought to the knowledge of the truth through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren, according to the spirit of revelation and of prophecy and the power of God working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many as the Lamanites, as believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. For they became a righteous people. They did lay down the weapons of their rebellion. But they did not fight against God any more neither against any of their brethren. Thank you. It's okay if we can stop there and discuss some things in that verse. There's a lot happening in there, a lot we can um, feast on this morning. Um, thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites. And I guess um, the Nephites weren't always a good example, but I think the traditions of the Nephites would be focusing on the coming of the Lord and his atonement and the need for repentance, the need for a savior. Whereas like the Nehors, which uh, some of those teachings are among these people, actually a lot of the Nehor teachings was that you didn't need a Christ. You didn't need a savior and that all will be saved in the end. Um, so returning back to those traditions of the Nephites, I would think it was the good traditions, the Christology, the looking forward to Christ and laying hold upon repentance and those ordinances. Um, another thought I had was that um, it says down the bottom, uh, many of the Lamanite, Lamanites believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord and never did fall away. And Mormon is writing this account. Um, and this is before he gets to the part of them kneeling before those who are their enemy coming to slay them. So it really stood out to me that while receiving um, covenant and ordinances and walking in repentance um, doesn't mean that we won't be caused, we won't suffer um, and we won't be challenged in our faith. We won't, I mean, we will. Um, yeah. Anyway, they were some of my thoughts um, initially. Any thoughts? I just noticed just now that it says twice, um, as sure as the Lord liveth and as the Lord liveth. And that, um, so he's using that as sort of a, like a verily, I guess. Um, mm. I don't, but uh, also the, I mean, not that this is like a big point for probably most people here, but, or all people here probably, but um, this is before Christ was even on the earth, right? So, but as sure as the Lord liveth is still, he's still using that as a, like, this is so certain, you know, even before he's on the earth, yeah, even before he's resurrected. Yeah, thank you, Fawn. That's a great point because it says um, they were brought to the knowledge of the truth, not the understanding or the hope or the belief. Mm -hmm. It's an actual knowledge. And it, later on, it says that um, it was by the spirit of revelation, prophecy, and the power of God working miracles in them. And yeah. I think of uh, were they having experiences akin to King Lamoni and his father and all those that um, were taken, their spirits taken up somewhere. And so 
did they get knowledge of the Lord as the Lord liveth through these, um, the Lord working in them. Maybe they had those similar experiences of falling to the earth for a certain amount of days or hours. And that knowledge, you know, Joseph Smith talks about the five minutes in heaven thing. Right. And I wonder if that five minutes in heaven, if that's what they had, that's what caused them to never fall away. Yeah. So it's knowledge based. It's a surety. Coming into the Lord's presence, perhaps. I, I imagine a near death experience may be a little different, but it seems like people who fall under the Holy Spirit and have an experience. Denver describes it to us that he says the Lord's first order of business is to cleanse you and to heal you. He calls you by name so that you're comfortable and feel recognized. And then he tells you you're forgiven of your sins. He can't bear to be around them. So that's the first things he, he's going to do anyway. But it's kind of a... I know it's got to be a faith game because he's going to cleanse us of our sins. So it's, it's how we're not believing right. You know, I was having a discussion with somebody the other day. It was like Adam and Eve were in God's presence. They walked and talked with him. Then they sin sinned and cast out and forgot everything because they couldn't even remember what he was like. I mean, they had all these children and they couldn't describe him enough for them to have faith in him for how many generations? So it, it's like they really forgot everything because I would have thought they would have been, you know, before they forgot everything, that they would have been like, hey, you know, we walked with God yesterday and he, this is what he thinks. This is how he is. And it would have been very easy to raise up children of that would have had faith in that being. But if they really lost everything, then it's they're like us babies to where... They don't even know the nature of their parents. And that's what Joseph Smith says. We have to figure out that nature of our parents. And so that's, I guess, kind of my thing right now. My mind must be working on this, the next puzzle piece because it's like, uh, if we don't figure out that nature or have the proper faith, we're in that mist of darkness in Nephi's dream or Lehi's dream, pardon me. Yeah, and I think about, as, as you were saying that, um, with Adam and Eve losing, you know, some of that knowledge and that veil of flesh being put in place, how maybe even their own, while well, I look to myself and my own journey of growth and development and making my mistakes with my kids and, um, and, and so maybe a lot of their kids didn't believe them while they were trying to find their way back and making mistakes along the way. Um, until they had accrued enough knowledge and were brought back into the presence of God, then um, maybe what a, uh, you know, those contrasts in their parenting and their understanding and um, to where they were before. Um, There was uh, something else that stood out in here. Um, they did lay down the weapons of their rebellion. They did not fight against God anymore, neither against their brethren. So, and later on, it talks about weapons of rebellion and weapons of war. So there's uh, two different things there, although they could be the same, but there could be two different meanings. And so I looked up um, rebellion and rebellion before God um, because that was the weapon they used to fight against God. So I was like, okay, what are weapons of rebellion? Any thoughts? I mean, we know what swords and guns and all of that are and what they do, but what are weapons of rebellion? Well, if... if sin is rebelling against god then our sins are weapons so when the Lam lamoni king lamoni says i would lay down my sins to know thee he's laying down his weapons mm -hmm. 
that's one way of thinking of it. Yeah. Good morning, Julia. Um, what did you say? How is everyone? Hi, but good here anyway. <laughs> I hear you. Good, thank you. Um, so I looked up rebellion and um, it brought me to the covenant, the words of the covenant. Um, the words of the covenant require us to have left behind or um, not take up our weapons, uh, destructive and vile practices of the world. Um, and the Lord says, all those who have turned from your wicked ways, and this is where I think he gets specific about some of the weapons, um, lying, deceiving, all whoredoms, secret abominations, idolatries, murders, priestcrafts, envying and strife, and all wickedness and abominations. Um, and somewhere else it's mentioned that Ephraim is the one constantly in rebellion. And Ephraim must come back and must heal too. Um, rebellion can also be uh, forgetfulness, forgetfulness of, um, there is a theme in scriptures about remembering the Lord's work with the fathers and how he delivered them and uh, brought them out from bondage. So there's a forgetfulness there, there's a forgetfulness of, um, you know, the things Joseph Smith taught from the restoration, the things that God gave him that we were to receive, um, failure to honor God in the land. Um, another weapon of rebellion can be the flaw of impatience or over enthusiasm, like walking in things and pushing through things and, um, before God and heaven have authorized it. So, um, which then becomes uh, iniquity, working cross purposes to God's work underway. Even if one's heart wants to serve God, when we show impatience and over enthusiasm, um, it's iniquity. Um, and then there's that scripture that says all those that will not take up the sword must need flee to Zion. So I wonder if not only, you know, not wanting to physically harm each other, um, having a heart like that, but also laying down these weapons too, um, which are the ways of Babylon, uh, then we must flee to Zion. Any thoughts? There was a lot in there. <laughs> I, I think today we're seeing a lot of these weapons used both kinds. Yeah, and I think a lot of the weapons that we use, I've certainly used, have been to protect myself too, like um, from the traditions in my upbringing of broken trust, um, wounds um, that have left emotionally and psychologically scars where I instinctively want to wall up my heart and put a shield around myself and, and not trust. I, I've pushed people away or truth away um, because yeah, of self-protection or so I thought it was self-protection. Um, yeah, so we use these weapons in all different circumstances, all different you know, areas in our life. So I think it's important to be aware of them and yeah. I just keep looking at this and saying, you know, you, 
you've seen or you've experienced, you know, true conversion as what is read in this paragraph. And then I'm, I just keep going, what happens when you stray away? I mean, you've been with the Lord, you've had this true conversion, you've seen it, you know, with people who join the gospel and then even serve missions. And then, I mean, I chatted with the gentleman who served a mission and didn't even know the story of Abinadi. So I just keep um, wondering what, what happens. Any thoughts? <laughs> You mean what happens in what way, Melissa? What do you mean? That you fall away from your true conversion or, you know, you fall into the abyss of life. I think we yes. have an example of that happening right now. Like with the covenant, the Lord said with what's coming, you have the light and the darkness appearing. Well, in, in a person's life, this same pattern can happen. So in other words, the Lord uh, blesses you with the truth and you either as we hear the servant say today, pay heed and diligence. Many of the prophets have said that before in the writings, but if you heed that whispering and it directs you to another whispering, another one, you're fine tuning the word of the Lord or his whispering in your own life. On the other hand, if you're listening to the darkness and fine tuning that voice in your life, well, you're straying further and further. And so like with the covenant, it says, you won't even be able to comprehend the things of truth. Well, you take somebody who was a missionary and would have interpreted scripture one way in their life, and they were there on the path, and then you listen to that voice for a while, and you're over here. And now you're going to interpret things very, very differently because you can't even, you can remember that you used to think differently, but you can't think that way anymore. But Matt, isn't some of that the, the pattern of what we have to go through in this life? Um, That's yeah, you know, the not, den covenant. not denying the covenants in particularly, but going in and out of learning and then deciding maybe I feel this way. Or I mean, Christ had to go to the lowest abyss, the deepest um, everything to experience to. Um, not that he was a sinner, I'm not saying that, but to know the both sides of how things darken the light. Isn't that some what of what we have to go through that pattern of um, until we get ourselves solid enough on the path? Yeah. The contrast, the brackets being removed, exposure to mm -hmm. all those contradictions and, and, um, despite going through those contradictions like the lame lights here they never did fall away I think because they had a true personal conversion whereas like maybe a missionary um, that falls away well there's pressure in the LDS church as a rite of passage into adulthood to serve a mission and there is um, kind of a sometimes can be if one doesn't serve a mission, they're looked at, well, they must have done something unworthy that made them, you know, they couldn't serve. Um, but also coming from the false traditions of our father's restoration, um, from the restoration, um, who weren't really our fathers, like Brigham and, and all of that, um, being taught for generations to read the scriptures in light of a certain way and applying it outside to everyone else and not ourselves. Um, so we never really reach the heart of the matter um, that these scriptures are about us and the great need for repentance. We never perhaps saw um, our awful state because we always applied it elsewhere and we're good, <laughs> you know? Um, so how could there be a real conversion in heart to the Lord there's love for sure and belief and a wanting to serve but knowing that these scriptures are talking about me um, I think that was um, a deep level of understanding for me that this is me 
this is my need to repent. I'm not as good as I thought. Um, well, on the, if I can say something. On the other hand, um, didn't Denver say something about taking the covenant? I can't remember the talk, but once you step into that, this new covenant that's offered, it's very important that you stay with it. Do you remember what it, what it was he said? But it was like it's a new level of accepting the Lord that you better can handle with care. That's not how he said it, but um, does anybody remember? I don't remember exactly that talk, but I remember some of the context about when you have an opportunity for covenant with the Lord and you accept it. You can't just exit out of the covenant um, because you change your mind. There's uh, there's consequences, and not that God's been mean. It's not that at all. It's just when you have an opportunity and you turn from that opportunity, you lose some ground. But maybe like a person needs to go and re-evaluate and and get some more understanding and surely truly like they can rejoin the covenant at any time but then i think that was the context is that what you're talking about i i think so i was just trying to remember there was something that he said that was really well there's a place in scripture that it says that if you begin the work and then turn away from it you, you will be condemned and so, and I think it, it is talking about like a Latter-day worker. It talks about when people are working in a, a vineyard or an orchard. And so if you come along where the Lord is working and you begin to work with him, you pick up the tool and you start that labor. If you then walk away from him, he's going to forget about you. And Unless so, you turn and go back. What's that? And, you know, he says we can always repent um, and turn back. Um, but at the same time, it's pretty serious to have that kind of knowledge and, and turn away. And then at the same time, I think there's also a mercy of God that, um, like, if, if one wasn't fully understanding the ramifications of covenant and um, they leave it for a time and uh, work on themselves and their relationship with God and, and then come back and rejoin it. I think um, that there is hope in that too. Um, well, yeah, I, I do with too. How, I... With how like, we don't know if we're going to have breath in the next hour. Like, we have lost so many people in this movement and in our communities that, and unexpected people who have gone through the veil. Um, like, I wouldn't want to wait to rejoin and, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just like while we have breath at any time, we can turn and face God. But um, I don't know for myself if I'll be here tomorrow. I hope. Uh, um, but it, things have been so surprising like that lately that um, I want to, I think at one minute at a time, do the best that I can with the understanding that I have. Yeah, and sometimes that mercy, I mean, that mercy is always wonderful. And maybe, you know, for some that, I mean, and myself included, I, if I was to lessen my my commitment or whatever it wouldn't be rebellion it would be uh it wouldn't be a weapon of rebellion it would be a weapon of tiredness mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes you just get tired but it says here that they never took up rebellion again i mean they they believed and they were converted and they never did fall away um so i just a thought you know that melissa just wondering because we all have different stages of of our um, unless you commit the unpardonable sin of rejecting God Himself, 
while he's while you're looking at him you know mm -hmm. denying his existence then he will continue to work with you i think uh in every circumstance mm -hmm. um that's my belief at least um yeah. well that's what we've been taught i have mm -hmm. questioned even that before don on i have questioned whether the unpardonable sin must be beyond anything we know because i can't mm -hmm. imagine you know, I, yeah, it's not because you got angry with God one day or because mm -hmm. you left the, the LDS church or because, um, you know, I'll leave the covenant bit alone because I, but um, it's not because of those things. It's, it's because you, you, you reject him because you say, I don't want what you're offering. You know, mm -hmm. I, I prefer darkness to light. I prefer ignorance to knowledge. I prefer um, anger and hostility to peace and, and love. And then I think he was self-destruct. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, literally, you think of, we're really getting off the subject. But <laughs> you're, you think about having that kind of knowledge and then standing in the presence of God and saying you don't exist. Uh, and, you know, we talk we read about the fire that comes with the Lord, you know, not that he wants to destroy us, but it's just because his brilliance is such that we couldn't be in his presence. And, and there was one place we read where, I don't know, you read it in a, a quote, Eva, I think about that. Um, they're destroyed. And how did it go? I've always heard that they, um, I've always somehow been told taught that those that are irreparable in that sense that they self-destruct they're just taken back into matter and and it's not wasted it's just a re a redoing of matter but whether that's true i have no idea so don't you know don't <laughs> don't believe I, that i think uh the lord will use every um way to reclaim um, I think that's just who the Lord is, every way to, to reclaim and even one in open rebellion. You know, that uh, losing the light of Christ, it brings consequences once again, not because God's going, I'm offended and I'm going to like be mean to you now, but it's just natural consequences yeah. of, um, of a hardened heart. But um, we're told and that's different, yeah. We're told in the word of God that even those um, things that come upon us, those hard things, that chastening, that um, stuff that we have to go through is God's mercy so that maybe we'll get to a point where we'll cry out to him and instantly right there, he's there. I and, love that part. <laughs> yeah, I'm reminded too that uh, maybe... Well, just in my own journey, um, I missed some steps in my own journey. And you know how we talked about it before, when a baby learns to crawl and then toddle around and then walk and run, there are some babies that don't ever do the crawling stage. They just are on the ground and then they can use the furniture and then they walk. And so in adult life, um, they have some uh, difficulties in, I don't know what it is, psychologically or um, an impairment in mobility. And part of the treatment for that is they have to go back home and crawl around their home because they need to develop that, um, that skill, that motor neuron skill, skill. And so I have noticed that I have uh, missed some steps, so to speak, throughout my life. And so the Lord has allowed me to go back and relearn some things and then carry on. So I kind of think that is like repentance. Um, the Lord allows us to, he won't ever force us. He allows us our choice. We hope we don't uh, wait in the mire too long, but go learn what we need to learn, go eat those corn husks and then come back. Mm -hmm. Thank Looks goodness. like Matt disappeared. <laughs> His internet must have dropped out. 
So is it my understanding then that if you accept the covenant or, you know, you, you choose that, that path there, it's not going to be like, you know, all these um, pressures of staying within that covenant, that there is room to grow and move. And is that what I'm understanding? Or if you accept and choose to do the covenant, you have this pressure of not ever being enough or doing, you know, how you can. <laughs> I don't think you ever have pressure. It's not pressure. It's choice. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know many of you, so you don't probably know my story very well, but, you know, um, I'll just briefly recap. Um, when I took the covenant, I took it under what I thought was a good premise, and it turned out to be a false premise, which was um, the scripture in Moroni that says that um, you can know with a certainty that every, every good thing is of God. In other words, God did not tell me directly that this was the choice that I should make. And I took it upon the scripture and which seemed, you know, fair. <laughs> it's God's scriptures. It seemed like a good choice. And um, uh, afterwards, when I uh, was struggling to know with why my husband was having a hard time, um, the Lord kind of said to me, well, if the scripture was enough, why would you ever need to come to me? And um, so it was kind of a rebuke, but at the same time, it wasn't a rebuke of partaking of the covenant. It was a rebuke of not waiting upon him to do so, to saying, oh, I read the scripture. It says everything's good of God and I can accept it on that and and go forward. And I did have a point and I'm getting, I'm losing it, but <laughs> um I don't I don't think it's ever pressure. I think God will work with you at every step, at every way that you need in every every possible way. And he was very kind to me in that in in instructing me and accepting my choices at the same time and um and continuing to do so you know today and now so yeah i guess that was my point. <laughs> thank you fawn thank you so much for sharing that i really really appreciate your story and your journey and that you're here with us and and how yeah the lord is merciful and kind and loving and we're always in it's inviting it's an invitation um well and, and you know if i can make another comment um thank you that was great fun to hear um on the zoom meeting that i attend on sunday they had a man i can't i can see his name from iran um that came to america anyway he has he has taken the covenant and he's um, Shazam. That, that's not right. It's sh S H A M Sham. Anyway, um, and he he still attends church, and his kids go, and he um, he hasn't uh, taken his name off the rolls, but he is as strong in the covenant as anyone I've. I've known, I mean, what he has said, you know, um, and I was really impressed that he, you know, he said, this is my path uh, because Brian Bowler asked him, well, how, how does this work for you? And, and he told him, I know I'm supposed to be here and also know about the covenant and have taken the covenant. And then he brought up what, what you just did, um, Fawn, about, the Lord works with us wherever he wants us and however he chooses to use us. 
um, in or out of the covenant, I guess. But in the covenant, there's a lot of us that have really different paths to, to walk. Um, and we need his mercy all the time <laughs> and his forgiveness. But we're not in open rebellion, I don't believe, because someone goes to church or because they... I mean, I've even thought about going down to attend the local community church here just to be around some people, you know. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Yeah, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is the it's the softening of the heart. Um, so anyway, I appreciate what, especially what was said fond by you and Melissa. So yeah, Colleen, uh, as you were saying, the softening of the heart, I wrote down heart on my paper. I always scribble on my paper while I'm talking, but um, I'm reminded of the three things that can remain pure. And uh, I forget what the other two are at this point, but one of them was our hearts. The intention of our hearts um, is one of the things that can remain pure, even if in our actions, <laughs> we, do, we do weird stuff, but um, in that weird stuff, God upon the heart. So I wonder what the other three are or the other two. Do you want to remember that? There's uh, three things that can remain pure in this world. Maybe it's God's love. Uh, no, let me check. I'll see if I can find it. Um, I'll try and find it and then I'll share it later. Because it'll okay. take me a while. Yeah. I've heard it, it too. Right? Once in this class, but I don't remember it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've heard it too, but I don't remember. Now I'm super curious. Um, let me type, just type in three things. Remain pure. Where do you type that in, in the Denver's podcast? Um, I just typed in on his website, but I should website. probably go to Restoration Archives because then that will search everything. Um, yeah, if you go to Restoration Archives, there's a search and it will search all the scriptures, all the talks, all the podcasts. Um, Three things remain pure. Okay. Oh, it came up first up. It's in um, preserving the restoration. Um, so ask yourself, what can remain pure even here in this awful world, what can remain pure? There are three things that can remain absolutely unmolested and uncorrupted. The truth is one uh, which is fixed and cannot be touched by us. The second one is God's love, which is free and available to all. Neither the truth nor God's love requires effort on our part. And the third thing that can remain pure here is our desires, our heart. Um, yeah, that, that's the quote. It's in talk 10 uh, on, in the transcript about page 13. And then he expands a bit more about those three things. So. You know, in, in talk 10, um, that's the original talks, correct, by Denver? Is that what you're saying? That was when he was really getting um, to the end of his, where they were going to take his membership away, correct? I think uh, they took his membership away with the very first talk. Uh, his, well, his, his first talk talks about the church like he's a member. I've been going through them. Oh. I didn't think they excommunicated him until the ninth or tenth talk. 
Does anybody know? Because if, because, well, I, I may be wrong, but anyway, that's interesting that he, those things can remain pure no matter what anybody, <laughs> mm -hmm. what I was thinking. Now I'm going to go read uh, maybe we, Carleen. Thank you. I, I Google, but <laughs> put that in when, when was Denver excommunicated? I think yeah. it was. Um, Carleen? Uh-huh. I believe he was excommunicated. I think he got the news that he was excommunicated on his way to give the first talk. Oh, really? But, okay. Yeah. But the church, um, he appealed the excommunication and um, the church rejected his appeal. Um, you know, closer to the 10th talk. Okay, I bet that's what I'm thinking of. And you, Eva, you're, I'm sure you're right. So, so you think about him saying that at that point when it was absolutely final. Mm. And, you know, I feel like my thought is at that point, those leaders could have been, could have accepted the Abinadi that came into their midst and said, okay, you know, we've been brought a true servant here. We need to wake up and start to do diff do different. And I think in that pattern, that's what happened there. Just my own thought that that, that, that could have happened at that point. Yeah, and it could have happened. I just remember, like, as we were talking about the missionaries and thinking about my own uh, early life all those years ago, thinking that the Book of Mormon applied outside of myself. And it was unthinkable that, that I guess, um, that the condemnation and the warnings were applicable to the LDS church and the leadership and the members. So I guess they're so entrenched in that understanding that it's blinded, um, it's, it's caused a blindness and yeah. Well, and can you can you imagine how these three things that remain pure that that were listed in that talk mm -hmm. would have strengthened him at that point, and they strengthen us. You know, regardless whether we're in or out of, of church affiliation, or or whether we're alone, like it feels like I am except for this group um, and the Sunday group and my friendships. But these three things really make you so you don't rebel. You know, you may have times when you go up and down, but you don't do this. What is it we're reading about? Uh, you don't you don't get upset. And, and what was the word? There were two things. Use the weapons of rebellion. You'd use these weapons of knowing these three things are true. Mm -hmm. Those are good weapons. And two anyway. of them come from the Lord, the truth and God's love. And we reciprocate with the third one that can remain pure, the desires mm -hmm. of our heart. Now you stop and think about there's always an opposite to everything that Satan has. A weapon of rebellion there's going to be a weapon of not rebellion. A weapon of war, there's going to be a weapon of peace. And these, these, these Nephites, Lamanites, use the weapons of, of not rebelling and, and not having war. And we don't think of them as weapons, but the weapon of the light of God is pretty powerful. It's like a sword that you can carry with you and you can cut through a situation if you need to. And you can sort of figure it is, you know. So anyway, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. Oh, my goodness. You're not on a soapbox. I love your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank, Thank you, Melissa, for that great discussion. Yes. Um, great, oh, great thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Brian. Hi, Brian. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> Hi, Brian. 
Hey y'all, good to see you. Bright shiny faces. <laughs> so, hey Brian, what up. was the name of the, what's the name of the man from Iran? I couldn't say his name. Sh Shireen. Sh okay. Shireen. Takmili. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, an amazing guy. So, <laughs> another, I like uh, your. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. You. <laughs> oh, what I was gonna say wasn't important i was going to tell colleen i liked her name shazam <laughs> she thought it was shazam <laughs> well, I, I knew it wasn't but i thought it was something like that <laughs> it was close maybe he's undercover you never know so <laughs> <laughs> and melissa when you when you go back to washington dc you better take your sword oh. of light. <laughs> so I think uh, Shireen is actually part of my opinion. God's quietly gathering one of a city, two of a family from all over the world. It's not like it's going to happen in one instant, one day. This is a process that's happening literally right now among us. And so uh, you can look on the online fellowship and see one from this continent. There's one from that continent and one from this you know, city. And in a spice of small, small and simple means, great things can be brought about. So it's, uh, he truly doesn't have to operate in a big manner. He can operate in a very small manner so, and fulfill the scriptures needed. So. Yeah. Isn't it by the, by small and simple things, it'll stop the mouths of the great Kings in our day. Um, yeah. The weak things of the earth shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong that man should not counsel mm -hmm. his fellow man. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that we should all. Yeah. So, and by small and simple ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, cool stuff. Shazam. <laughs> Shazam. <laughs> I never could speak English correctly, so forgive me. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's awesome, bro. I'm not going to be able to look at him and say his name properly because you know, I have a hard time anyway. So, I'm at, well, uh, to, <laughs> just, right? uh, you're cute, cute Carly. <laughs> is this is this Sunday your fellowship you're talking about? Is that another Zoom? Yeah, it's about link? 40 to 50 people come. You ought to come. Well, is it a after. link? How do I get yes. to that? I will send you the link. What, what, there what you go. Thinking? What am I thinking, Bowler? What are you thinking, <laughs> Brian? It's a, way for, it's a way for me to have the sacrament. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's really helpful for me. I feel like when I get in touch with you. Nope. <laughs> I thought Diane was saying something. She's talking to her kids. There we go. Um, what do you say we read one more verse? Um, and then tomorrow we can discuss this new name that they take upon themselves in the presence of the Father King, tying him back to the covenant of Nephi and Lehi. So this is like jumping into some of that prophecy, I feel. Uh, or types for our day. Um, Brian, did you want to read verse three of, uh, do you have your scriptures? Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Or someone um, else can. I can um, read, no. Uh, okay. uh, can you still, uh, can you still see me? Mm -hmm. Or hear me? Yeah. We're yeah. in uh, yeah. Alma chapter 14 and verse three. Just one second. I'm a 14 verse three. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Fourteen three. Now, these are they who were converted unto the Lord, the people of the Lamanites who were in the land of Ishmael, and also the people of the Lamanites who were in the land of Madonai, and also the people of the Lamanites who were in the city of Nephi, and also the people of the Lamanites who were in the land of Sh Shalom, and who were in the land of Shemlon, and in the city of Lemuel, 
and in the city of Shemilam. <laughs> and these are the, the names of the cities of the Lamanites who were converted into the Lord. And these are they that laid down the weapons of their rebellion, yea, all their, their weapons of war. And they were all Lamanites. And the Amalekites were not converted, save only one. Neither were one of the Amulonites, but they did harden their hearts. And also the hearts of the Lamanites in the part, that part of the land, whatsoever they dwelt. Yea, in all their villages and all their cities. Therefore, we have named all the cities of the Lamanites in which they did repent and come to the knowledge of the truth and were converted. Thank you. It's interesting that there's only one of the Amlicites, and but that one was so important that was needed to be numbered. Um, and how there are seven cities mentioned and the thousands upon thousands that were brought to believe in uh, the correct teachings and the Christology, the traditions of the Nephites um, of the coming Christ were all Lamanites except one um, Amulonite, Amulonite. Um, and Hugh Nibley, um, he really has a love for the Hopi people. And he talked about how this passage um, of scripture really reminded him of the Hopi, how for the majority, the Hopi are real peace loving people. They um, don't like to take up arms or to fight. And that's why there's been a lot of um, other things coming in and taking their lands or whatever it is, um, commerce out of some of their sacred things. And um, either. Yes. I, were the, was this person, I can't remember if the Amlicites were from Nephites or Lamanites. Um, and, they, and they call themselves Amlicites. I can't, do you remember? Does anybody remember? What's the question? The, the were from Nephites originally. And they became very wicked because, yeah, that's yeah. usually. They, you're yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah, they were the priests. They were the priestly, whatever. I mean, I, when I read that, I was thinking of the LDS church, you know, mm -hmm. and these other break us. It's like they, they were the, the priestly ones that had broken off. So, so it would have been like uh, the priest that um, Abinadi spoke with, maybe. Those types. Mm -hmm. Yep. And also, and, and, yeah. That's what I thought, but I wanted to be sure because that even makes more of a difference. Uh, yeah. Why would he nearly mention that with the Hopi? You wonder if that's where his this one person came from and evolved. I don't know. I was just wondering if the Hopi why he nearly would mention that. And how here in the scriptures, like the tables are turning. And it's the faithfulness and the belief and the uh, willingness by these Lamanites. And that's why going back to the beginning of our discussion this morning, I'm like, these people are better than myself. And they're not this primitive race of savages or anything like that. Like they are willing to lay down not only their weapons of rebellion that we discussed, but their weapons of war and to suffer death. Um, they're, just, they're so converted and they recognize the false traditions of the fathers that they lay, they bury their weapons and then they are willing to get slaughtered to keep their swords bright and unstained from blood. Like, and here we as a people, we contend over things that don't matter as much. You know, we're still using our sword words against each other. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it for that verse, unless there's any other thoughts. Oh, uh, some of the contentions that arise, because um, we have... King Lamoni's father's like massive kingdom with 
these seven cities and these different cultures um, of people. And so now we have this uh, conversion of a lot of the Lamanites. It's equivalent to like a state forming within a state. And that's really shaking up the people um, that are not converted. And it's part of the reason why they come against uh, later on um, with their weapons and swords to kill the people and these converted ones kneel before them and take that slaughter. But yeah, putting it in our language today, it would be a state forming within a state, which is a pretty big thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, send me some positive, uh, your positive energy while I uh, keep my sword up in DC, okay? Your sort, sort of peace. peace and peace. Keep my, <laughs> yes. I need you all. <laughs> well, maybe we can all pray for you and for everyone else. Let's um, I'll share my little screen. Can you please send me a copy of this today, Eva? I missed Vaughn's story. I came on at the end because I was having tef technical difficulties after being on for a while and everybody's like great story great story and I'm like oh I missed it yeah for sure that's one thing that um, maybe Melissa could get those those two <laughs> sorry can you repeat that Colleen Uh, maybe you could send the meetings to Melissa if she. she, she, yes, she yeah. yeah. I normally send them to Melissa. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. You do. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. them very much. Yeah. Thank you for sending them to me too. I try to listen when I can. You're welcome. I figure you travel so much and you have many hours on the road. You might just want to <laughs> listen to familiar voices as we waddle through the scriptures. Totally, yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, would someone like to offer a prayer? I can if somebody will. If, yeah, if somebody else doesn't want to, I will. But... Hey, thank you, Brian. I guess I'm doing it or <laughs> you, if you, you know I need to learn that I, I open my mouth too much <laughs> so I'm learning that it's like uh here am I eventually you can't there's so many here am I send me is like you can't say it all the time <laughs> so anyway um I can I can start and I'll pray for uh Melissa perfect. and then um if you feel to add anything else or others can add anything um, yeah, go ahead. Hold on one second. I like that I'll idea. Try. Okay, good. Our Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come before you and offer our gratitude for our study morning that we've been able to open the scriptures and apply things to our lives. We are grateful for the example of these faith-filled Lamanites who are so converted to lay down their weapons, not only of war, but even more importantly, their weapons of rebellion. And we recognize in our day today that we too must lay down our weapons of rebellion so that we are not found in iniquity before you. We ask for our hearts to be softened, for our um, consciences to be made aware of the times when we take up our weapons, even in um, what we think is self-defense. Will you help us to become meek and humble and patient and easily to be entreated? 
and to have a hope in you, an actual hope and a promise that no matter whatever you see fit for us to endure through, that we can continue to grow and ascend to where you are and to the throne of the Father. We pray for a blessing to be upon Melissa as she travels today to visit for the first time her uncle on her mother's side. And she has asked that she can be reminded of um, the sort of truth and to be a peacemaker. And so we ask that she may have the presence of the Holy Spirit to be upon her and that in this um, meeting up, this reunion uh, with her, her blood family, that they will be able to feel your love coming through her and that they will be um, edified through the conversation and that it will be good deep conversation and that she may, may, if the opportunity presents, be able to speak truth. And we pray for all those upon our list um, that you will succor them in whatever capacity that they need and answer their prayers and petitions in a way that they can recognize, we pray for provision and protection to be upon the widows and the sick and the motherless and fatherless, for those who are poor and, and struggling and for those questioning their faith, we ask, Father, that you would be mindful of each person, each child and the way words fail me um, but you know each one individually and at a level that they don't even know them themselves and so we we just ask in behalf of them and um, I open this prayer for anyone else who desires to add thoughts And if there's no one else, then Father, we, um, oh. oh, Brian, yeah, <laughs> go sorry. ahead. Didn't realize I was muted. Um, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, who come before thee and thank you for the prayers that have been offered and 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 the intents and the thoughts and the feelings, both spoken and unspoken. We acknowledge our weakness and our need for you always at this time and. and Acknowledge that we are all, particularly people on this list, coming from the best perspectives and understandings we have, and, and you know, even when this causes disagreement and conflicts, we pray that we can learn to live peacefully without harming each other, and and to to walk in a way that's that that could be worthy of, of eventually living in Zion and. and we pray one day to be boring and to be free of the drama that is so much a part of this life. We pray to, to seek your face and, and make intercession for those around us too that, that we could even have a claim for. But um, we pray to, to seek you and to... Um, uh, the best outcomes that are possible for not even necessarily this life but for our eternal souls um, we seek you and, and and again we ask a blessing upon all those that are on this list that that you can give to them what is best for their hearts is is our prayer eva you can, you can finish we, if you'd like we thank you heavenly father for and we welcome your correction and 
we thank you that the heavens are open and that we have cause to look up and rejoice. And we say these words and the thoughts of each person's heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all. Love you all. Love Good you. luck on your trip, Melissa. Thank you, love. Keep us updated. Safe everyone. travels, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> hey, I, I put the, I put the uh, covenant for, for anybody. There is, uh, it's on covenant. It's listed on covenant chat, but I sent the link, I think. But um, here it is in chat. If if anybody else that hasn't come there wants to come, they're they're all welcome. So there's a, uh, there it is. So hmm. it, if you. you're hopefully you can get it to it. If, if that doesn't let you in, then contact me and I'll send you it directly. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you for your prayers. I love you. Love, love you too. Bye-bye. Everybody have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Fawn. <laughs> Bye, Julia. It's good to see you. Bye-bye.